done on the policy level to ensure that our students are prepared for, um, for college and to make sure that it's an opportunity available to all of them. Because I, I agree, um, at least for, for my kids and I believe for all kids, college, I, I like how you said it, it should not even just be an expectation, it should be a demand. And um, states have gone about the process of raising their standards to make sure that the quality of education that is provided to all kids is a, at a high, at a college and career ready level. Because under No Child Left Behind, when um, accountability was set up, the goal was for all kids to be proficient. But in order to, make, to be proficient, what happened was in a number of places, we dumbed down what it meant to be proficient. So now, most states have adopted the same, not all, but most states have adopted the same common core standards, college and career ready standards, so that we're providing the same high level of education to all kids. Now that's about the expectations of what happens in the classroom that's happening at the policy level, at the state level. That does not directly address the attitude that, that you're describing. And I'm not sure what ways in which policy um, can address that. Um, I think that we need more parents like you that will take it. And um, perhaps a policy level would be within our schools of education, um, that as teachers go through preparation programs, that um, cultural competence and cultural sensitivity is a more prominent part of teacher education and um, part of the, um, the alignment that we need to see happen between our high schools, our middle schools, our elementary schools, and the higher education system is to make sure that when teachers are being prepared to teach in higher education, that they're both prepared in terms of high quality instruction, but also high quality relationships. Thank you. Um, sir, back here. Hello, Bachelor, everyone. I'm with Idea Public Schools from South Texas. I'm happy to be in North Carolina today. It's very green. Uh, <laughs> so I, I have a related question. Um, you know, in the K-12 core movement, one of the major headlines as we're talking about this morning is that the teacher is the most significant variable to student achievement. Um, my question is, is this part of the higher ed conversation? I'm wondering, um, perhaps these inequities do not exist because of students or because of support services. Maybe it's a college teacher instruction and professor problem. that I do think that the conversation is probably not happening as, as strongly as it should within the higher education community. I know that K-12 colleagues, and I'm sure uh, Philip and Will can speak to this even more, are certainly pressing on higher education institutions. There's a lot of um, kind of backlash in the higher ed community around trying to measure quality and outcomes and how we do that and uh, arguing about what are the ways in which we do that. And I think teacher ed is actually at the forefront of that conversation in a lot of ways because they are being measured in ways and there are metrics being developed that aren't being applied to other programs. So it's emerging in higher education, but I wouldn't say that the higher community has taken up as strongly as the K-12 community has. Yeah, I, um, I'm, I'm glad you asked the question. I think it actually relates to a number of questions that we, a number of comments that we've heard. Um, statements is so true. We, we 
simply uh, cannot uh, sufficiently and adequately um, teach our children if we don't if we don't fully know them. And so, so we're looking for ways to provide a level of support um, for teachers um, that would uh, buttress uh, the same kinds of uh, evaluative processes that we're also looking at at the national level. Thank you. Um, we're going to go here. And just uh, we have three minutes left, so I want to be respectful of that. Please know the panelists are here to also follow up. So if you can keep your questions very short, we'll try to get to the three who are here. But I apologize. We're you know want to be respectful of everybody else's time. So should I speak in Spanish better? Faster. Hola, my name is Mati Lazo Chatterton from Cary, North Carolina. Thank you for the White House Initiative and your fantastic uh, panelists. I'm here as a parent of two grown children and an advocate. And I have two children. And I learned the cultural and educational uh, system thanks to special education uh, because my son has a cognitive disability and regular education. My question is, what do you have find out in the research through best practices in the country for people with cognitive disabilities in order to pursue the dream, not only the American dream, the disability dream that my son did say, uh, in universities. Four year, uh, my son has a certificate of the Wake County uh, Community College that he wants to pursue now. We have two very good programs through the UNC Greensboro here in North Carolina and the Appalachian University. But I'm a, you know, learner like you were talking about, memorize. I would love to memorize the best practices for year college in our country yeah. that um, my children and other children that we are working uh, with can attain it. Or where we can find those. Yeah, great question. Anybody want to? Um, you know, uh, I mean, I would just say that, look, um, we don't have good research. My perspective of uh, looking at students with disabilities and serving them well in institutions of higher education. Uh, we spend uh, too much effort, and I've been guilty of this in the past, of focusing on traditional students, traditional institutions, and traditional apples. And what you raise is a critical population that doesn't get the awareness, attention, and resources needed. So uh, I wish I could uh, rattle off a list, but um, I think we would love to hear about the two programs you articulated and how, as policy and researchers, we can perpetuate that and to instill a conversation that you ask a question about, but that we don't often discuss. I'm going to pray so you can have a... Oh, okay. Yes. 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 All right. <laughs> uh, we'll all meet here, and we each have platforms that we can help get that out. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, back here, and then here. Hi, my name's Mediana, and I'm a dreamer. I'm part of an undocumented youth group called the NC Dream Team. Um, and my question um, was, um, came to me when the lady in pink said that um, there's a lot of things that can be addressed at a local level rather than looking at the national level, right? Um, but in the absence of help from local organizations, from state organizations, um, any grants, any money, um, for organizations like us who are volunteer-led, is there anything that the White House or at the national level can do um, for people like us in terms of grants, um, in terms of any kind of money to trickle down to, you know, us going and doing presentations in like high schools, um, to um, to spread the word about like what, what scholarships do exist for undocumented youth, and like um, to spread the word about, you know, getting active and like in their community. Um, so yeah, in the absence of local statewide stuff or groups that help us at the local level, what can you guys um, bring to the table? <laughs> so I think that certainly other folks here can um, provide some, some thoughts as well, but I think getting, as when you're part of a community organization, getting connected to various efforts that are going on. There are a lot of cities that are starting to mobilize around college attainment, so looking for champions within a city government is one way to make sure that if there are local resources that they can help bolster. A lot of these uh, cities are trying to find ways to bring in community organizations and do cross-sector partnerships, so I think that that's one way to think about it. There's also a lot of state networks, so college access networks at the state level, the regional level, uh, you know, at the federal level, there are the College Access Challenge Grants, which are uh, funneled through the state, but those are things that frequently will flow to local partners, and so that would be one area. 
And then also uh, community-based organizations do uh, apply for and receive TRIO grants, uh, which are federally-based uh, funds at times for, um, for supporting those kinds of programs. They more frequently go to colleges and universities, but there have been uh, some community-based or organizations that get those resources as well. And I would just know that at the national level, United We Dream has a lot of networks nationally and others, and MALDEF has a collection of scholarships for students who are undocumented. Often they just are scholarships that don't ask citizens their status at all, rather than overtly being for undocumented. So you have to pay attention to those kinds of things. Uh, so that's what I've seen at the national level to complement what she's been talking about. But I think you know the sad reality is the onus is on us to find them and to create them, because it's not happening I'll be quick, I promise. <laughs> My name is Justin Clapp, I'm the Director of Access and Outreach for Duke University, and I am also the Telegram Tepler. Um, <laughs> I, my question is actually back to that point, that $8,000 gap, and I'm wondering, and not speaking about Duke or any other institution in particular, what types of institutions are going to be the ones where you see the smallest gap, where students can find um, the easiest route financially to education? Sure, thank you for that question. So I think we've seen at, um, a number of four-year institutions make commitments. So right here in North Carolina, UNC Chapel Hill does have a covenant uh, where they seek to cover expenses for students who are low income. To the extent, and I think that, that they've shown that that program's been really successful for the low income students who are at Chapel Hill. It's not necessarily increased the number of low income students coming into the institution. So I think there's both the recruitment aspect as well as the support once they're on campus because students need to know it's really an option for them to actually take advantage of it. So I think that's a piece of it. So we've seen some of those commitments from four year institutions. Um, again, when we look at the data nationally on where most four year institutions spend their um, institutional aid dollars, it's not on low income students because they are incentivized to try to increase. Uh, selectivity and merit amongst their incoming uh, students. So to the extent that uh, institutions are spending their dollars in the same direction as the Pell Grant, I think that can be the most uh, impactful. Community colleges, uh, the Pell Grant, oh, oh sorry, uh, the Pell Grant can cover tuition at many um, community colleges, but there's still cost of attendance. And so what we see amongst Latino students in particular are lower, low, lower levels of borrowing uh, and so even after loans, they have about three to four grand that they, they try to cover through working too much um, and or stopping out. And so I think we need to be really attentive to what that gap looks like. And the people who are putting together the aid packages know what that gap is when they send those letters to low-income students and students of color. So being really mindful about if you gap to students, how are you going to help them get through? Last comment. Uh, just uh, uh, wanted to, there was a question raised earlier regarding um, President's uh, My Brother's Keeper initiative and didn't want to totally ignore that. Wanted to say that um, that, that certainly is something that uh, crosses the span of, of, of the pipeline issues that we talked about. Um, I'm certainly available after uh, to talk more about that. I see Marvel Davis in the back is a, a, a White House initiative who's also working uh, very heavily with us on that. So. so thank you all. Please help me thank your panel.
could give you information about that. And lastly, they are opening the floor for folks to submit questions ahead of time so that the panelists can uh, respond to those during the forum. So today is your last day to do that. So see Michael for a flyer about this next step on Latino education in North Carolina. And I'll turn it over to you. I went back and forth. Uh, and, I, and I want to say I'm the first generation on one side, my father's side, to have a high school degree, and on my mother's side to have a college degree. And I say that because I think it's still the story of my completion, persistence, workforce engagement is, is repeated over and over again. Um, and I'm proud of that. And my resiliency is my badge. And um, fortunately, it has been something that has driven me well through. But I wanted to highlight a couple of things. I think Deborah, who is an incredible uh, co-founder of Excellencia on their work, and if you do not know about Excellencia, please go to their website, because it's so important to see the great reports that they're doing. I use it over and over again, and sometimes I do that hitting my head. You know I knew that, but now I have the data to really support that. Does anybody ever have that feeling? Sometimes you report and go, yeah, I knew that. But you know what? Data helps, right? A data-driven environment where we flip the script, where we're asset-based, it makes a difference in creating the narrative around change, right? And that's what we want. But one thing that wasn't mentioned, and I think the piece that, as a professor at Brooklyn College, that I know for the students that I've worked with, and for many, that's um, uh, the City University of New York, both at the moment. Um, I think it's important for folks to know, people go to college for what reason? What reason? What do you think? Why do they go to college? Develop themselves. Develop themselves. I love a room of educators. Develop themselves. <laughs> Feel good. Cognitive learning, critical thinking. But thank you. Get a job. No, I, I'm not against all those because obviously I believe in that. The power of transformation. I wouldn't have worked in education and um, youth development for more than 20 years if I didn't believe in that. But there is an end game. And particularly for Latinos who contribute to a family wage even as young as 13 years of age, contribute to a family pot to support their families, a job is critical. Do we get that? And so I want to give you just some statistics on the argument of why we should be thinking about persistence and completion and why I have this great group of talented people here. By 2020, 65% of the jobs will require a post-secondary degree. Do we get that? Not a, not a credential, a post-secondary degree. Okay? Between my father's generation and the students that are going to college now, that is close to a 40% increase in the expectation of those who need a college degree. Right? That's important for us to know. I think the other thing that's pretty significant for us to know, too, is that the areas where we see the most enormous growth in this demand-driven economy Anybody knows those areas? Yeah, technology, we know those health, right? Technology broadly across, right? It's where Latinos are least represented, okay? Or underrepresented. And I'm putting those out there because there are enormous powers of choice that happen every day on behalf of the Latino student who goes to college. And it doesn't mean we steer them, but we need to understand, and I feel strongly also speaking as a faculty member about what is the data out there? What are we saying? What are the directions? What are the opportunities? That's not a gloom and doom scenario. Trust me. It's one of opportunity. It's one of talking about how we can be assets and one about how we can frame a narrative on how it supports in areas where we're underrepresented. Well, on this panel today, um, we get to do a couple of things. We get to talk about what are strategies and tactics for increasing access to persistence. Completion, and I would add the second piece, transition to the workforce. And I'd love to hear from folks on this panel about those. Um, but first, we're going to get to start with just a brief introduction, five minutes each on each one. Um, one last thing before I continue, and I want to say this piece. Though we have not been able to do this in uh, a meaningful way at this session, if anybody is interested in talking particularly about what are alternative certification programs for people who were court involved, which is a significant number of our particularly of our, our Latino men and increasing number of Latino women. We should talk on the side about that. We could do a separate symposium on that, but I do not want to ignore that population. Okay, because I think that's a critical part. 
composition as well, and that's where I spent some of my uh, professional career. So with that said, enough on the set and uh, my soapbox. I'm done with that. How's that? I get to jump off of that. I get to introduce, first I'm going to say the names of each of the panelists, and then each of us, each of them will take us on a five-minute journey around thinking about strategies around persistence um, and access, which would be great. The first is going to be uh, Dr. Alice Ann Bailey. She's director of Go Alliance for the Southern Regional Education Board. The second is going to be Mauricio Gago, Director of Latino Memphis. The third is going to be Dr. Constanza Gomez Joins, Executive Director and Division Head for the Center for the Global Learner in Durham Technical Community College. I love the idea of the global learner. Nice. Yes. Uh, and the last will be Donna Weaver, Spanish Service Manager at North Carolina State Education <laughs> Assistance Authority. I now turn it over to Dr. Alice Ann Bailey. Thanks, Lisa. Um, yeah, we have, I've been told five minutes, so I've asked her also to keep me because, um, as like all of you, I'm very passionate about this and could go on forever. Um, and I might be preaching to the choir here, uh, but one of the first things I think we really need to keep in mind um, is that students and their parents, families know that having a higher ed degree will lead to a, a better quality of life. They know they need it, they know they'll have better access to health care, make more money. We don't need to waste our time spinning our wheels convincing them all of the reasons why they need to go. They know. Um, they have very high aspirations, and I, um, I think we really need to keep that in mind. And this is a, a great thing that we can work off of. Um, we don't need to spend our time uh, trying, trying to convince them of that as well. Sometimes our low-income students have been found to have even higher aspirations than our high-income peers. They're very driven, so we, don't, you know, we need to keep that in mind. Uh, but what, why don't we see more uh, low-income and underrepresented students um, graduating high school and going into some form of higher education? One, as we know, there's an information barrier. Um, and we really need to keep in mind, I think, in working with these students, particularly uh, Hispanic and Latino students, um, is that we need to do a little more research and getting to know them. More focused group research, more individual getting to know the students that you're serving. because. Uh, they're all coming from very different and complex backgrounds. Um, but the research that I have done with these students shows that we're doing a good job of getting the information out right now. Um, we've seen a large increase in the past 15 years of uh, the number of students who are going on to higher ed. But as you know, they're not completed once they get there. Um, so there's more that we can do. They know the basic steps to getting into college, you kind of know, well, you know, I need to get good grades. I need to take, it, you know, the SAT, ACT. Um, I need to apply. I need to fill out the FAFSA. Well, what they don't know is what the FAFSA is and why they have to complete it and how. And so my research with, with these students shows that they are very, very eager for detailed information of how. Um, it, it, they want to know the nitty gritty you know, of, of how to accomplish each one of these major steps. So when you ask students um, why they're not going to college, um, what I have found is there are two major reasons. Uh, one is financial. Um, they tell me that they cannot afford it, so why even apply? Why even graduate from high school? Because they, I can't afford it, so there's no reason. Um, or they, uh, as Lisette uh, alluded to, they feel like they need to start earning money right away to support their family. And we need to respect that. Um, I do a, a training program with those who work with uh, students to counsel them on going to college. And one of the first things that we study is cultural competence, as our last panel talked about. And it's really, really important to understand um, what those values are in the home and respect those and then build a plan off of that. Um, the, other, the other reason uh, why we hear students on going to college is academic. Um, they either feel that they can't get in or they're not going to succeed when they get there. And that's something that we really need to work with students. Both of these, you can argue, there's a truth behind it. There is a gap between what the Pell Grant will cover and what the family is able to contribute. So that there's a bit of reality there. And the same with academic. They truly may not be prepared. But I think uh, for a large majority of students, they are academically prepared. They just don't believe it. Um, in in uh, Tennessee, and I'm, I hate to pick on Tennessee, I see some of my Tennessee friends here. Um, they ask students, are you going to college, yes or no? And um, if no, why not? 77% of the students said it's because someone at this school advised me against it. So we really need to take a hard look at 
um, our, our administrators, our counselors, and our teachers, how they are trained, and what kind of messages they're giving to their students. And we need to develop students' sense of academic self-efficacy. Um, and then uh, how you combat negative stereotypes. Stereotypes are something that form uh, in students very, very early, at a very young age. And unfortunately for our underrepresented students in higher ed, there are a lot of negative stereotypes about their ability. And what happens when there's a cultural negative stereotype about you? Uh, you, lower, you have lower self-efficacy, you have lower motivation, you set lower goals, and you disengage uh, from that area for which there is a negative stereotype about you. So for, if it's an academic stereotype, you tend to disengage from school. Um, negative stereotypes also increase anxiety, uh, which can really play a powerful role in performance on things like the SAT, ACT, and um, it impacts, if you have a high anxiety, it impacts how you learn in the first place and how you're able to perform um, on assignments in the classroom. <clears throat> um, so in order to develop better self-efficacy, there are typically three ways <coughs> uh, persuasion, just telling the student, yes, you can do it. Um, behavioral modeling, uh, which is getting someone like, they have to be like that person, they have to relate to the model. But by showing students someone like you was able to do it, you're much more likely to convince them. And if you haven't um, heard of Greg Walton, I would uh, I encourage you to look at his work. Um, he's at Stanford University, and um, he's done a lot of work in this area with um, using upperclassmen um, to come in and work with um, first and family students, or just showing them videos of them saying, look, it was hard. Um, my first year of college was really hard, but here's how I was able to do it, and you can too. And that can work to increase their self-efficacy. Um, and the other is first-hand experience, and that's really the most powerful way of increasing self-efficacy, is working with students to show them that they can in small examples. And so um, in closing, I have a lot more to say. Um, we also need to be um, better working with our counselors. I heard the uh, first panel talk about the high caseloads. Um, we don't need to write our counselors off and just say, because there's so few of you in the schools um, that you're not able to serve our students and therefore we're gonna do all these other things. Um, we need to address a lot of problems with, um, with our counseling community. And I can uh, later on pass it on. Thank you so much. Hi. <laughs> well, yes, uh, Mauricio Calvo with Latino Memphis, is that you know? Yes, sir. That's good. All right. Uh, I want to kind of uh, put, put things into perspective how a small nonprofit in Memphis, Tennessee got into the business of college access. And uh, I think it's an interesting story. For many years, Latino Memphis has uh, been proudly and humbly serving thousands of families access uh, human services. We have dealt with everything from food stamps to human trafficking. And, and we keep growing and we keep getting bigger and we see more and more people. And I want to point out two stories uh, that came out recently that were kind of a wake up call. So, what well, was good news and bad news? The good news is that the Urban League uh, released a study last month, uh, a couple of months ago, I'm sorry, and it talks how it, talk, it, it deals with unemployment and race. And in Memphis, it mentions that 3.8% of Latinos are unemployed. Uh, compared to 6.5 of whites. So, I would say, you know, I guess the Latino community is doing really well. Everybody has a job. The sad part of the story is, uh, on a different story, the, the census believes that 40% of Latinos in Memphis live in the poverty level. And this is like really, 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 really low. So, we have to ask ourselves, you know, how do we stop this revolving door? Again, I said earlier, we take our job with our pride and humbleness at the same time, but we have to stop this. And we got an opportunity uh, three, three years ago, opportunity to knock on the door, uh, I call it an ladder, where the Tennessee Higher Education Commission called Latino Memphis. They had been invited by the Lumina Foundation to apply and be participants of something called the Latino Student Success Initiative. And this was a multi-year effort to increase the number of Latinos going to college. And they were looking for a local Hispanic partner. And we're like, sure, why not? Yeah, right. Uh, we, we, we would love to partner with you. And I want to tell you that from that point, our whole organization has changed tremendously. Not only our capacity, but our, you know, our mission, 
uh, our, our focus is, is, is just, uh, it, it has been uh, a switch from an overarching goal that mirrors Illumina's goal of, you know, X number, of, right now we say significantly increasing the number of Latinos who have, uh, who have obtained post-secondary education by the year 2025. So I want to tell you how even we continue to provide social services and basic services, everything is with that one end in mind. How do we get more Latinos to college? Well, I mean, they need food stamps and they need social services and they need these things, they need whatever they need. Uh, so the parents can support the students. So that's kind of what we have been working with. Uh, okay, great. So in, the, in this process, uh, we took a, a, a very simple approach. Uh, that is, we're working in the ground with five high schools. We couldn't work with colleges at the beginning because quite frankly, there were not that many Latinos in college. But we had an enormous population of of, uh, of a growing population of, of high school, middle school, and elementary school Latinos that were coming into the pipeline. And so we we decided that that was the, the way we had to go. How do we work on college access? How do we ensure that these kids who are very self motivated will get to college? So that was at the, at, you know the one on one. I'll be happy to talk more about it in a minute. But we also look at the partnership, a collaborative that will support this work. Certainly, we couldn't do this work alone. And, and, and so we partner again with Tennessee Higher Education Commission, with the Office of the Mayor, with the Community so Foundation, just all kinds of people, everybody looking at this. And uh, from there, we have become somebody at each one of these tables voicing the voice of, of Hispanics in the higher uh, ed. We learned a few lessons, a uh, bunch of them. Uh, as an immigrant myself, uh, and, and somebody who went to school in the United States, I, I thought I knew, but really I knew very little. Uh, because my reality 20 years ago was even the reality of my clients today. Uh, we found, for instance, that students are motivated. And the parents want to have their kids to go to college. They just don't know how. So we had to add a parent component. Now, we, we kind of knew this from the literature, but it's different when you're in the trenches doing this. Uh, affordability is our number one uh, issue. And of course, that's connected to policy and other things as well. Uh, but most important is the idea that college is, 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 is a global thing. You know, we are trying to create a culture where college is, is, is just something that we do. And somebody here talked about earlier, the support system. I mean, this is something that we have to do on a one-to-one -one base, one-on-one uh, -on -one with individuals. But also, students need a support base. They need to know that they're not alone in this thing. So, you know, I'm sure we'll talk more uh, uh, in Tennessee. That, that just close to say we're this close, and I know North Carolina was the same way to have an in-state tuition bill. And we're going to continue to push forward in the next legislative session. Thank you. Our largest department in the center is ESL, English as a Second Language. 
In 2013-2014, we registered 1,367 Hispanics, but 66% of our ESL student population. In 2012, the ESL department received a grant from the National Center for Family Literacy and the MetLife Foundation for an initiative that we call Parent Academy. We partnered with several of the public school systems in our service area, and we held a series of workshops and invited the immigrants and the political refugees and just international students in general to attend. And we conducted these workshops and we explained some very basic concepts, how the educational system here works from, high, from elementary school, middle school, high school, to the community college and beyond. Okay, they were very well attended. Of course, the majority of our participants were Hispanics. Um, we saw 176 parents from 35 different schools. What we learned from these workshops and what we confirmed is how important that personal connection is. How important not just the personal connection with the student, but also with the family. We surveyed the parents to get some information, and 100% of the parents, 100% said that they really wanted their children to move on to post-high school education. They just don't know how to do it, but 100% want that. That's just a common nature parent. Right? You want your children to succeed. We also learned that it was very important to have somebody they could identify with, preferably somebody Latino, or at least have interpreters there. Okay? And although that grant was only for a year, we continued our, our outreach efforts. In the last two years, we have uh, visited several ESL classes in our district high schools. We have attended parent information sessions, we have attended Hispanic summits, uh, conferences, and we have made a very conscious effort to educate not only the students and the parents, but the community at large and the professionals in the high schools, the counselors, about the different educational opportunities available to the students. Um, one particular event that stands out was one that we uh, did for the DPS, Durham Public School District Long, um, system uh, in a central location. We invited, and it was four Latinos and Latino students and families, and we invited them to come and um, work and conduct an information session in Spanish. I conducted it in Spanish, and I explained some very, very basic concepts because you can't assume that they even know that college, if you go full time, is four years. Um, what I noticed is when, they, as they were walking in, they were very shy. I dare say, almost intimidated, looking. Oh. Um, they were very shy, almost intimidated. And as the presentation in Spanish progressed, and as I talked to them individually, they started asking questions, and more questions, and more questions. And by the end, during the question and answer session, they were asking some very difficult questions. Um, and of course, after that presentation, the one-on-one, -on -one, I saw so many of the parents and students one-on-one, -on -one, and they were asking some very difficult questions. Um, so that one-on-one -on -one connection with the parents, with the families, it's very important. We had students from elementary school to high school um, at that session. And they come back to us. The, the students that we go and talk to at ESL classes, and um, I can think of particularly four um, students that came to us to Drum Tech after that uh, event. I'm going to have to get it. After that event. But what was really rewarding is that they came to us not just for their students and, and seeking admissions into the community college, but also that parents found out about the ESL courses. So we enrolled two women in ESL courses. One of the other parents enrolled in early childhood. So it's a dual role. We were there to educate the, the students and also the food families. Um, so in January, we had a meeting with the Regional Latino Student Success Committee and our Student Success Support team. And we talked about what Durham Tech is doing and next steps. And our strengths is that we have strong support from the leadership of the college. The creation of the center is an example. Our faculty and staff are very committed to supporting and promoting diversity. And I have worked on projects, interdisciplinary and interdepartmental projects, um, with some very just motivating and brilliant and inspiring 
faculty members. We have targeted our Latino community. And we're very proud of this, but not content. But we're very proud of the fact that our Latino students persist and graduate at similar rates as the other students. And we're very proud of that. But we're not content because we need to reach out to more Latinos in the community. We have a lot more work to be done. Primarily, we have very few bicultural and bilingual faculty and staff. And this touches upon what somebody else said just a little bit ago. Um, and I could go on and on and on about everything we still need to do. And I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to talk about it just a little while. Financial aid forms, even for students who are U.S. citizens. 
that and says that opportunity exists. Um, you know, the policies are, you know, are in the cost. You know, I mean, I think everyone has said that. I'm going to skip over that, but not because it's not very important. It's probably one of the essential areas that we all think is important. Um, helping students um, and parents to have a sense of self-efficacy and to also see themselves as college students. I think it starts with inspiration. Quite often, um, I talk to counselors in elementary schools, and they're discouraged because many of the Latino students aspire to do what maybe, not, not So when it comes to parent engagement, I think we have a lot back here, uh, it's, it's about creating a toolbox. And I know that's like a cliche term, but it's true. I mean, the, our parents really need the know-how. And, and again, we're, I know we're speaking to the choir on this. So what we specifically did, uh, we engage with uh, NCLR, National Council of La Raza, for their pilot school program, the Gitos program. Now, I know there's no perfect program, or perfect curriculum out there, but we have to start somewhere. And it was, a, I think it was a 12 week session. And even before we started, I said, like, hey, there's no way you're going to get parents come back 12 times. Uh, it, it was really, really hard. So we shortened that, uh, that particular curriculum into I think, six sessions. And I was kind of pushing it. But really, it was, uh, was a, a good idea to, to begin engaging the parents. Now, we began by engaging the parents of the students that we already had. 
but that didn't always work out. So it, this, this particular group of, uh, of, of high schools, the high schoolers that we're working with, uh, they are very passionate, and they carry so many Latino values with them, but they are also so, they're so independent at the same time. So yeah, so sometimes you go to a college and they bring a start to the to the admissions office, and they hear a parade of 10 people, the whole family, but other times, when you really need a family engaged, it's like they show by themselves. So, because they're kind of I mean, they're teenagers and they feel like really behind and parents and stuff interesting. But for, for the parent engagement thing, we were able to engage uh, a, a, a small number of parents, I have to say, in our first class. And, and parents really, really got engaged. Now, one thing that, that was striking was some of the students were telling us what to tell their parents. And I thought that was amazing. And we listened to that, and we had a student panel talking to parents. Uh, one of the things that I found out uh, with, with our students as well, some of the students feel frustrated and sometimes angry to the parents for putting them, putting them into this situation. You know, again, we, we do a lot of talking with them about, look, your parents have made lots of sacrifices for you to be here, but then as a teenager, they see the world in a very different, you know, with different lenses. And they, got, they feel frustrated because the parents don't have the tools to walk them through. So again, similar to what uh, Constanza is doing, we were uh, showing them what ACT means, what this, but it was, it was creating this sense of community. Other parents believing that they were not alone in this thing, we did some uh, strategic things, so they would become friends among others, we ended up with a carne and a picnic and things. So hopefully these parents are gonna be, they were down here and over and over, self-advocates and advocacy for themselves. So, so anyway, so we are, again, we started with NCLR, we, we tweak it, and it's working amazingly. I think that's, I would encourage that if you do anything, certainly you have to engage the parents in whatever works in your particular community. So we started seeing the first wave of uh, Catholic students in the fall, in 2013. Is it, can you hear me? Is it working? Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. In the fall of 2013. And um, I have to say that I've worked with the most amazing people they're all sitting back there in the back, and every DACA student comes through our office. Okay, every DACA student sees our international student services director, even though they're not really considered international, but she has taken that upon herself, and she personally advises them um, how to register, how to get into the program that they want to get into, financial resources, scholarships, etc. So. We have been very successful, I believe, in creating a one-stop shop, not just for Latinos, but also for our DACA, for, for certain for our DACA students. Great. This question is for both Donna and Alice. Considering the
the things that um, is I, I would really raise up that's happening in North Carolina is a recent legislation uh, geared towards counselors, uh, which says that counselors cannot proctor exams and they have to spend more of their time counseling. Um, and that's a, that's a big step. And I alluded before the fact that uh, a lot of times in our schools we kind of write off the counselors uh, because one, they have very, very high case loads. Uh, the national average is about 500 uh, students to one. In some of our districts, it's 1,200 to one. Uh, so uh, we tend to kind of just write off our counselors. And the other thing is that they, um, unfortunately, will are in uh, schools doing whatever the administrator is telling them to do, uh, which is a lot of things not related to working with students, unfortunately. They're, they are uh, you know, doing the bus lines and monitoring the lunchroom and serving as the uh, registrar, a lot of administrative support tasks. Um, so I think that that's one uh, policy, uh, just one baby step forward um, but another is um, how we train our counselors. Um, right now, counselors who get a master's degree in school counseling get no college access advising training at all. We assume as parents that, that the counselors are the ones who are going to be able to do this with our students, and they're not trained to do this, unfortunately. So they're asked to learn it on the job, which is very difficult uh, because of all these different things they have to do. Uh, one of the things, as I alluded to, they need more training in cultural competency, um, and particularly in working with Hispanic and Latino populations, uh, getting to know that student is of critical importance because um, they're coming from many, many different uh, countries with many, many different cultural uh, values, uh, and they're not all the same. Um, the other thing that people don't realize is when we bypass our counselors and working with our college access um, programs, which are fabulous programs, um, uh, but unfortunately, these people who are working um, in our uh, community-based organization programs uh, do not have access to the things that counselors do, which is how the students are placed in what classes. And we start tracking our students into being college-bound versus non-college-bound um, in late elementary, early middle school ages. And the counselors are often the ones um, who can go work the system and advocate for the student to a teacher, no, this student needs to be in that AP class. Um, so we're trying to better train our counselors to be advocates. Um, advocates in the school for creating a college for culture and advocates for their students. Um, so things that counselors need to know uh, in working particularly with Hispanic populations um, is helping them get involved in more extracurricular activities. Um, it, again, going back to understanding the cultural competency in the home, um, sometimes uh, in Hispanic populations, they don't have a lot of time um, for being involved in these extracurricular activities. So counselors need to do more advocacy to reach out and engage students and families as opposed to waiting for them to come to visit them. Um, and they need to be teaching parents how to navigate the system. Two more things I would say. Um, a lot of times we are, uh, I hear again and again and again when I work with students, we need more, uh, you know, I'm the one speaking for my parents and I have to explain everything to them. And I need more resources in Spanish. I need more resources in Spanish to get this over and over again. The problem is when I work with a lot of organizations that are going to practice that policy all over the place, um, is that they say, well, I translated it into Spanish. Well, translation doesn't always work that way. You have to start with a native Spanish speaker and write it from the start. You can't just simply translate it because that doesn't work. Um, and we need to be doing more in schools with specifically um, community liaisons to do these kinds of things. The other thing I would say on a policy level, uh, unfortunately, I work for, I, well, this is not my unfortunate, but I work for SREB, the Southern Regional Education Board. We work with 16 states in the South. Unfortunately, in many of our southern states, um, we have very prohibitive state policies um, for access for uh, Hispanic students um, and non-documented students. Uh, in many of our states, it used to be that what well, was kind of this don't ask to tell. Um, there are you know non-documented, undocumented um, institutions that will help these students, and we can get you in no problem. Um, then policy shifted to well, we're going to treat you like an international student. We're going to treat you like you're out of state. So you have 
have to be out of state permission, which for many of these families is, a, you know, that's a complete barrier. There's, there's no way that student's going to be able to come. Now we have shifted uh, to even if you pay out of state tuition, you cannot access this institution. If you are not documented, you cannot go to any state institution at all, period. So, um, you know, that's a huge barrier. In state tuition! So one of the things that Latino Americans does, we, we have a heavy emphasis on, on policy. So we have a policy department and we do research and, and uh, so it's global and nevertheless is significant. Uh, I, I, I give you my, at the state level and at the national level. At the state level, I think momentum has begun to happen. And I think the conversation is, 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 is you know, it's a new day in Memphis, it's a new day in Tennessee, in North Carolina, throughout the Southeast. Uh, I think both sides are seeing this as a, a all the benefits of, of, of particularly, uh, you know, students accessing uh, college. So, uh, you know, it's just a very obvious. Like there, are, there are, and I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. So, we think that might not solve all the problems, but at least it's an entry point. And in policy, that's a really important thing. You know, that they were I was talking to, to us yesterday, just when the window opens, just a little bit, we got a jump in there. So, at the state level, I think that our best bet is is to see immigration reform uh, through 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 uh, in state tuition or access, you know, this this thing that we're talking. At the national level, I really believe that uh, after this election, something's going to happen. Uh, you know, with, with all due respect, I don't think this administration wants to live uh, with a legacy of of, of of this mark of so many deportations. And the other side doesn't want to you know, to take credit for that either. So I think people have made a calculated effort, and right after the election, I'm hopeful. Something will happen if for nothing else for political gains. Uh, but that's okay. When, when good policy marries uh, good things, we're okay with that. Uh, the, the one thing I would say, uh, you know, I, I mentioned the, the negative political climate in many of our southern states um, against um, undocumented students. One thing I can tell you that does work, that turns heads, that is effective, is working with the uh, business community and the business roundtables uh, in your state. When businesses come forward and, and tell the state uh, legislatures, this is not working and our businesses are failing because of these uh, prohibitive policies, that is what will turn heads and, and cause people to listen. But, um, so, you know, if you're in some of these other states that don't have such great policies uh, like North Carolina does, um, I think that's something that we all need to be working more is with our, uh, our business around people. Hi everyone, um, 
name is Kenny Murillo, and I'm a student here at Durham Tech, and I'm also a member of the NC Dream Team, uh, an undocumented youth and allied led organization that started in 2010. I uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I, one of my comments is with, um, with Dr. Gomez, Gomez Ms. Connie. And uh, since my experience here at Durham Tech has been really great, uh, the support system, it's awesome being an undocumented student. Uh, graduated in the top 10 of my class with honors and then not having the opportunity to afford a four-year college degree uh, was horrible. It was literally like, I, I was depressed. I, I, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, I cried. I wanted to, like, I, I didn't know what to do, right? I was, like I said, I did everything right in high school. I did everything right in middle school. And I thought, I don't have a social security, but that's not gonna matter. Because I'm a great candidate for university. I'm gonna go to a four-year university. This is not that I'm undocumented, this is not that my parents are undocumented. But then I was sitting in the top 10 of my class, uh, June 9th of 2012, and I was the only one who could not share with my friends uh, what school I was going to go to. Because I, wanted, I wasn't going to go to a four year university, I wasn't going to go to a community college. I was going to go to nowhere. And that was, really, that was really hard for me and for my parents, and especially after working so hard, my teachers, they were sad. Like, I was just crying, like, this, this is like not happening. Like, how can this happen, right? And it was really, it was, it was shocking. Um, I thought I decided to, I was gonna go back to Honduras. Uh, my, my dream was to go, uh, to go to medical school. I wanted to be a surgeon. And um, I've always thought about serving my community here in NC, in Durham. Uh, this is where I consider myself from. And uh, I thought, well, since I can't go to medical school here, I can't get my undergrad here in NC, I'm gonna have to go back to Honduras. Although I haven't been there for like 10 years. Um, the fraction happened, and I, I saw that as, as a sign that um, I should stay and put up the fight here. Uh, that's when I enrolled at a Way Tech. My experience there at being a, an undocumented student wasn't so pleasant. Uh, so I came to Durham Tech in the spring, and it was fantastic, it was phenomenal. Uh, Heidi, Heidi White and Connie, they've been very, very helpful as uh, keeping me updated with any changes or any, any you know, giving me hope and, and really, like I said, like a support system. Right now, I'm three classes away from graduating with an associate's in science degree, uh, working three jobs, and <laughs> just, just taking me. Uh, I work like at a tire shop, cleaning house with my mom, doing yard work, uh, paying waiting tables for the past few years, and then also as an interpreter as I kept in the hospital, uh, has been quite, quite the experience while taking classes. Thankfully, I see a whole 4.0 GPA, and I'm hoping that... I'm hoping to transfer to Wyoming State, but unfortunately, the ISA tuition rate, it's, it's the barrier. That is what, that's the reason I cannot, you know, go to, go, like, go to NC State. I can't afford thirty-four thousand dollars per year. Sixteen thousand would be much, more, much more feasible. Uh, so that's why I ask, like my state, it's like the opportunity to be able to afford it. Like my, my high school classmates, I've been living here for more than ten years, and I pay taxes. My parents pay taxes, and it's awful that like now I have a social security number, which I thought before that was I was paying out of tuition, and I'm still paying out of tuition. So it's just like something needs to happen. Um, with that, I started to sell tamales. And for the past every the past few months, every two weeks, uh, with the help of my parents, uh, my friends, and my community, we've been making 500, 600 tamales, on, and, and we sell them Saturday mornings. And this is all this for a college fund that will be used next year when I transfer to Wayne State. Uh, everyone in the community, I'm telling you, has been so so great to me, and and, and you know, hear out my story because um, it's, it's not like I'm special. The thing is that I'm representing like over 33,000 students here in NC. So obviously that this is an issue that we need to we need to focus on and it's something needs to happen. Again, um, right now we just had a fourth event two weeks ago and we've raised over 25% of the goal. And the goal is to raise 16,000. So I can offset the cost enough that I could pay 16,000, which is what I would pay if I was paying the same <laughs>
money taken aside for other students uh, to apply. And, and yeah, so. Don't forget us when you turn us. Say something about Kenny really quick. Uh, so Kenny, I, amazing story, and I think two things that need to happen if I were you, and I don't know if it's Eli with a Senate spine or something. It's it's great that you talk to us. Kenny needs to be testifying in front of the Senate Subcommittee yeah. on Education. Yeah. He needs to be the voice with the, with the round tables because I mean, really, who is going to say no to this guy? I mean, you know, <laughs> So, so really elevate that voice, and I think we as an organization, we, we have a responsibility to, to create avenues to elevate that voice. And the second thing is, as much as I hate, I, I, it's so difficult to hear these stories over and over again, it is certainly by default creating a resilience, a resilience in our community, right? making us so much stronger, because I have no doubt that Kenny will be a surgeon, he's going to be running a hospital one day, and it's all because of his sacrifices. So, uh, again, as much as we hate to see this, it is certainly making our community very strong. So, much for the Thank you. Thank professions. 
Um, a lot of our students, a lot of our Latino students pursue those two-year programs. Now, of course, given giving concrete and specific and clear information is very important. Remaining optimis optimistic is very important, but also we have to be realistic. Um, a student can come and take two years for the nursing degree, but then when it comes time to take the state or national certification exam, they're going to reach another barrier. So as educators, advisors, we run a fine line between encouraging them, absolutely, absolutely, but also being realistic. And that's very hard for me because I go for it, go for it, you'll make it, you'll make it, and they will, but we have to take baby steps. And But to your programs are very, very doable. Question. I want to contribute to the conversation. The question was asked, what else can we do to go ahead and assist students in getting them through? One of the things that we have been doing, I'm um, sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I always get me. Um, my name is Melody Rodriguez, and I direct the um, Hispanic Outreach and Leadership Program at Armstrong Ola, uh, which has been serving the community in Savannah for 10 years. And for the past two years, um, I have been directing the project of Camino. It's a college access, mentoring, information, and outreach, and it's one of the 13 sites that Lumina has founded with Latino Student Success. Um, we are a multi-sector collaborative of uh, 10 partner organizations, including Armstrong State University, where I'm located, um, Savannah State University, which is an HBCU, and Savannah Technical College. So we have the privilege of, of having an access institution and a two-year component in our program so that we can strengthen the pipeline of transfer students into a four-year study, um, which we have two of in, in our partnership. Um, one of the things that I have um, definitely noticed that has been instrumental in getting students through and avoiding some of these out-of-state tuition costs that they are incurring is considering things that are alternative in the school system, encouraging students to take AP, encouraging students to take IB, the International Baccalaureate and the Advanced Placement Exams, and once they're in college, remember that we do have CLEP. We have a credit level examination that they can take. Um, most of our native Spanish speakers get those uh, CLEP credits. They can take up to, uh, or earn up to 12 credits. Um, they can um, actually, uh, they gain nine with the entrance exam, um, uh, Spanish one, two, and three. And then in addition to that, they will have um, credit um, for three additional classes under um, an independent study. Um, so they can do that with Spanish, but in addition to that, we have some very talented kids. I mean, we just had one you know, prior to me in the microphone. I'm sure that they can go ahead and club English, and they can club biology, and they can club chemistry. And those are some of the classes that we're not thinking about. And every, every class that they go ahead and exempt through a club exam or through AP or IB, they are not paying in state tuition. I mean, out of state tuition for. So those are things that we need to consider um, and continue to encourage students to take. Uh, for our adult population, also in-service credit and experience for learning, there's a lot of things that are being done right now to try to encourage credit attainment through those. So I just wanted to, to contribute that. Um, we have what's called Career College Promise, and we've partnered with DPS, the public school system. And we have several models, but essentially they're all similar in that a student can be enrolled in high school and college at the same time, taking classes at Durham Tech Community College. And so they're earning college towards their high school graduation, but also towards college. Um, Oscar, who was one of our student speakers, is in that program. And by the time he graduates from high school, he's going to have several, probably the first year completed of college. So that's something that we very much promote to our Latino um, community and our Latino students. Because again, it's free. Whether they're taking classes, college level classes here or through Durham Tech, as long as they're still high school students, it's free. And um, Patricia Gould is not here anymore, but she's our liaison. She does a wonderful job. Oh, there she is. And we've had um, an increase in the Latino applications that we um, are seeing for this next round. This will be our last question. Uh, Philip Garza again from South Texas, Indian Public Schools. Um, so the panel's devoted to access and support. In my mind, and in our experience with students in college, um, we see that there's a lot of variance in support, in quality support, in investment in support. Um, and so I come to this question um, representing our students as consumers who are paying cash for college. Uh, and so my question to the panel is, what uh, recommendations would you give the White House in making um, 
uh, undergraduate institutions, graduate institutions, more transparent about their success with persistence in graduation? I mean, what is the White House doing? Because my cereal box tells me, as a consumer, how many carbohydrates I'm going to intake. Uh, if I'm going to spend $60,000 for my undergraduate degree, I'd love to know um, what I'm paying for. One thing that has happened, wow, I hear myself. One thing that is happening is this whole notion of a rating system. And people find that quite controversial, but I think that's, that's thinking about who is a consumer, and that is the person who is paying for tuition. And people may not agree with what the outcome of that may be, but I think that's an important shift in frame. I say the second thing is that there's an enormous amount of disorientation happening right now in higher ed. Enormous amount. We didn't talk about that, but there's enormous change. And I know we talked about for-profit colleges and how abysmal their rates are. To be quite honest, most community colleges meet the for-profit college abysmal graduation rates. So we're not, I don't want to blame either one.